Greetings, everyone. Uh, we are back with a new installment of uh, in our series, and we're delighted to welcome today uh, Professor Jeremy Black, um, a renowned British historian, uh, Professor of, uh, Emeritus of History at the University of Exeter. Um, he is a world-renowned military historian who has written extensively on diverse uh, range of subjects, but today uh, I have uh, decided to bring him on to discuss his newest publication, which is um, entitled The French Revolutionary Napoleonic Wars, Strategies for a World War. Thank you so much, Professor Black. Welcome. Thank you very much. And can I just say, it is to everybody listening, what is really exciting is in the field of military history, the key players, people like Alex and me, are not people in famous name institutions like Harvard or Yale. What is really interesting is you can get state of the art, really major scholarship at other places, Shreveport, which I've had the pleasure and privilege of visiting, uh, being an example. And I think that should encourage us all because all too often we adopt a rather out of date class system, uh, I'm no Marxist, but an out-of-date class system when we come to talk about universities. And in military history, the key thing is not the label you have, but the work you are producing. Indeed, indeed, absolutely. I wholeheartedly concur. Um, Jeremy, uh, this book is about World War, as, as you refer to it in the subtitle. Um, what were the strategies that you identify? And specifically, right, let me, just, let, can I let just me kind of, it, let me maybe uh, coach it, uh, Jeremy, in that, do you see continuity and discontinuity during this period? Right. Yes, that's a really interesting question. So first of all, I do see both continuity and discontinuity, both in terms of the subject, um, of which we're talking about, strategy during the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. And also, I'd like to briefly just give you the architecture of that book, because all our books, like your books, fall into an architecture. Nobody who is serious, and both of us write a lot, write a lot without wanting to have an original impression in each of our books. So this is the third of a sequence. And those sequences are my general history of military strategy with the original title, military strat, I'm being sarcastic, military strategy, a global history published by Yale, which set out the basic ideas plotting power strategy in the 18th century, which very much looked at the ancien regime of strategy and also looked at the actual emergence of the very term used in France in the late 18th century, although not a term that the French revolutionaries or Napoleon devoted much effort to, which is an interesting thing. And then this last book, as you refer to. And what I'm trying to do, as we all do as historians, is to look, and I think your question is an excellent one to start with, at continuities and discontinuities. Obviously, the people that began in 1792, the French Revolutionary Wars, were not coming out of nowhere. They didn't, as it were, spring from the brow of Zeus, rather like Pallas <laughs> Athena is supposed to be, and say, right chaps, it's the modern age. All these people writing syllabi in the future will know they ha we have to start anew. Of course, that's drivel as an interpretation. First of all, as, as in a way, it's very important that we should, you know, us two are discussing this because your perspective is very much, very strongly, although you range much more widely, very strongly that of a scholar who's a specialist in, shall we say, the eastern borderlands of Europe, whatever term one wishes to use. Yes. And mine is, as it were, the oceanic margins of Europe. <laughs> and what those remind us is in each of those cases, there were were powerful preceding periods that set examples that continued. And indeed, in the case of Russia, as we know, 
It was at war um, at the beginning of the 1790s with the Turks. It, it, that war is to resume in 1806 and in many senses is a key strategic element. Equally, it's only in 1790 that Russia had finished war with Sweden and that war is to resume in 1808, 1809. From the British perspective of an oceanic war against France and Spain um, and the Dutch, all all of which it is at war with by 1796. It had been at war with all of those three powers between 1780 and 1783. So at the level of continuities in that respect, there's obviously there. There is also the continuity in respect of the experience and attitudes of many of the individual players involved. Now, while it is true that in France, a lot of young men uh, got their start and were rapidly promoted into the French Revolutionary um, Officer Corps and then up to become general officers. It is also the case that many of them had had experiences um, in the pre-revolutionary army that were of some importance. And remember, as recently as 1787, France had nearly gone to war with Prussia in the Dutch crisis, many French units being mobilized accordingly. As recently as 1790, France, the French Navy had nearly gone to war with Britain in the Nootka Sound crisis. So there's continuity there. And lastly, uh, before uh, I pause for a second, there is the continuity in the shape that this is a war, rather like the American War of Independence, where we're encouraged to think of them as novel wars. And there are some new weapon systems, the first use of a workable submarine, doesn't work terribly well, but it is there in the American War of Independence, in the French Revolutionary Wars, of course, you've got observation balloons being used, you've got semaphore being used, you've got the first European usage, it obviously had an older usage in Asia, of rockets. But nevertheless, what is fundamentally the case is a marked continuity in weapons systems. And I've recently brought out a history of logistics in which I argue uh, uh, opposite to Martin van Creveld, I argue that in fact there's in many respects the French system is quite primitive in logistical terms and is dependent rather like German blitzkrieg on its opponent and on the particular nature of the terrain rather than having some uh, astonishing qualitative advantage. So I would argue here that there is in many respects in which people envisaging strategy have to play with an aspects that what, some of which are traditional and some of which have been seen before. And can I just end on that last point? Sure. There is a difference between traditional and seen before, and let me explain this. When I'm referring traditional, I'm referring to established patterns of behavior that already exist in ancien regime warfare and specifically, let us say, over the previous half century. When I'm referring to seen before, I'm referring to the extent to which, far from being totally modern, the French Revolution in Napoleonic Wars, in the sense of what we might call people's warfare or hybrid warfare or anti-societal warfare, whichever terms we wish to use, all of which play a role, is in many respects just a reprise of the warfare that had been seen in Europe during the uh, so-called wars of religion. Ideology is not new in the uh, 1790s and 1800s. People's warfare is not new. It has been there before. And it is the failure of so many historians writing on the French Revolution in the Napoleonic period, their determination to assert modernity, which leads them to underplay earlier and interesting examples of similar behavior. Well, uh, that actually segues very well to two questions, really, I have um, as a follow up. One, how revolutionary then was the re Revolutionary War? And a related question, uh, which I think you alluded to, uh, is we, we have this concept of total war being applied to the Revolutionary Napoleonic Wars, and you clearly don't find it justifiable. 
Well, I certainly don't think revolutionary is the term that would, to me, uh, leap to my mind. I mean, if one's thinking simply of France, uh, I would argue that um, the French wars of religion see a uh, mobilization across society. Um, the Fronde, uh, particularly, which are a later series of wars, the Fronde uh, between 1648 and 1653 see a similar pattern. I think one has to be wary of taking the greater scale of the French Revolution or the greater scale of Napoleon, the greater success, geographically short-term success, obviously, and the greater success, and arguing that that's ipso facto a proof of, no of novelty. I mean, in many respects, Napoleon is another example of the war leader on horseback, the ex extent to which he is different to, say, Nadir Shah of Persia, um, who campaigned widely in the 1730s and 1740s, uh, reaching as far as Delhi and into Uzbekistan and into Mesopotamia, Iraq. The extent to which uh, Napoleon is really significantly different to that is, I think, very problematic. I mean, like Nadir Shah, he takes over as, as a result of a violent discontinuity in this case, the fool of the Safavid Empire in the early 1720s, he takes over and creates a martial state which is successful for a while. Then Nadir Shah, in fact, is assassinated from within his, uh, within his army in 1747 um, and his empire collapses. There's not all that much difference. In fact, if one wants to look at a war leader on horseback, as it were, who makes a greater difference, I'd be going back and looking at Peter the Great. And I would say Peter the Great was more successful, more understood wider questions of strategy, including, incidentally, his attempt to, I'm not saying Peter the Great was a pleasant chap, but his attempt in the um, in uh, what we would call um, Estonia and the eastern part of what we would call Latvia, they called it Livonia, his attempt to elicit the cooperation of the Baltic German Protestant nobles, his attempt to create some kind of um, linked background for his more energized Russian state, I think he did, does better in the long term than Napoleon. Or you can say, if you like, rubbish, Jeremy, it's a matter of chance. If Peter the Great had been shot dead at Pultava in 1709, <laughs> we would all be saying the opposite. So, you know, there are problems here. What is very difficult to my mind is to build a narrative or analysis of military modernization on the basis of the French armies of that period. And there's a very interesting passage years ago, I remember, I was reading Arthur Ferrell's book on Macedonian warfare, and he has a passage at the end of his book on how far Waterloo would have looked different uh, to Alexander the Great. And he argues that, of course, Alexander the Great doesn't have gunpowder, but he has missile weapons in the, you know, the shape of archers and javelins. And he argues that it wouldn't have been that different. Whereas, obviously, as we know, a battle, a major battle of that scale would have been very different by 19. 1916. Um, and you could argue even by 1866. I mean, you can, there are still massed units on the battlefield in 1866. You've got to handle it with some care. But nevertheless, I, I would actually say that in some respects, the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars are a last flourish of a, conservative is the wrong way, but of a of a well-established military system, which had a capacity to change within it. So, you know, that doesn't mean it's unchanging, but which is very, very different to what's to come. And obviously you can see that very clearly um, in naval warfare, you've still got wooden warships battering away, um, away at each other at close range with limited accuracy, firepower, the warships heavily dependent on wind and wave, um, uh, large numbers of them being, uh, in the case of the British Navy, it loses more warships being um, 
uh, going aground during the war because of the difficulty of holding blockading stations than it lo loses to enemy action, French, Spanish or Dutch. Um, but the age of fighting sail, the last significant battle is the Battle of Cape Navarino in 1827. And that age has essentially gone within half a century of that. I mean, and obviously in terms of screw guns, ironclads and steam engines, the individual parts of it are going already prior to that. So I would argue that there is something to be said for a conservatism, uh, and I don't mean that to be pejorative or praiseworthy. One has to be very cautious. And here, as you know, um, I disagree with the military revolution people, of whom the most famous is Jeffrey Parker, but I think actually he encapsulates a very widespread uh, uh, custom in the writing of military history, which is that it's been affected by what I would call uh, modernization theory. And modernization theory developed very strongly in the United States after World War II uh, and very much influencing, for example, the thought about how a new form of uh, democratic capitalism could be more efficient and could be uh, people could be persuaded around the world to adopt it and it would be more successful than communism and it represented an optimal behavior pattern. I think that notion of optimal behavior patterns, that notion of developing towards a mod modern in which the modern is wherever we are at the present moment and people in the past get tick points or cross points because they don't appreciate that they're supposed to be developing between towards the modern. I mean, obviously I'm caricaturing it, but I think that element is still present in the conceptualization of many people that write about military history. And therefore, I think you have this curious mismatch. I think you have fantastic operational work out there. I think you have superb tactical work out there. I think people have made an enormous amount, sometimes an over amount in my view, of the concepts uh, described as face of battle and war and society. But I don't think the literature on the development of modern military systems and the development of military history, I don't think it's t often terribly profound or thoughtful. And I think it is stuck in some pretty antiquated ideas. And modernization theory is, I think, a classic one. It's about 50 years out of date. I mean, you know, it, it did fail in Vietnam, and that doesn't seem to have always been noticed elsewhere. Well, let, let me uh, kind of bring it back to the uh, discussion of strategy. Uh, when we talk about strategy for the Napoleonic Wars, let me kind of throw a, a maybe a, a curveball. Did Napoleon have one? Uh, because this is a long discussion that I've been engaged with some of my colleagues, and what, what's your take? Was he blundering to glory? Or is he a rational? Well, I think Owen, Con Owen Connolly's book, Blundering to Glory, is, of course, fundamentally about Marengo and the Marengo campaign. And I think Owen Connolly did a good job. Of, and I, I just say he's dead now, of course. Uh, I, I met him. Uh, I, I corresponded with him. Uh, I enjoyed his company. He was a vigorous thinker. And I think that that kind of person deserves praise. But let's take up your curved ball. Um, Napoleon, I think, had a very strong understanding that prestige won by military success abroad was the cement that would hold his vision of um, the revolution um, firm in both France and in France's conquered territories. That was, I think, his strategy. One that required, in a way, what he wanted to do anyway, which is campaign frequently, not every single moment, but very frequently. So he both enjoyed campaigning and believed it was necessary for his strategy, which essentially was that resting on creating a new regime. Napoleon had no idea um, of moving to a non uh, monarchical, non-imperial, non, uh, you know, destiny for France. So he's geared himself to a situation which is the hardest of all things for a dynast, which is to ensure continual success. I mean, you contrast that with, say, George Washington. 
George Washington doesn't need to win continual success. He establishes himself as an elective monarchy, and he establishes an elective monarchy which leaves him safe when he yields office, which creates a situation in which he feels reasonably confident that whoever succeeds him is going to have acceptable views. Um, and that, I think, is a very different kind of strategic background to the one that Napoleon has. Well. For, by that measure, as, as, as a person who has written extensively on the British strategy, how, what, did they British have a clear strategy of containing France during the Revolution and Napoleonic Wars, or was it evolved to what ultimately was a, a winning strategy by 1815? Well, I think that's an excellent question again. I mean, in the end, it becomes a winning strategy. I think it's fair to say that the British, if you had told them in 1793 that they were going to be embarking in a war which with two brief periods of peace was to last 22 years, they would have been absolutely horrified. And indeed, as as you all know, I, I wrote a book on British foreign policy from 1783 to 93, uh, dropped from a height, it might well be fatal. It's my most scholarly book. And I go in some detail into how the British government was really keen in 92 to stay out of the war developing in Europe. So the British government didn't want war. When war happened, it essentially sought to fight it in what you might call, again, without being pejorative, a traditional form. Now, that traditional form was to have a strong continental alliance. They'd failed to get that in the Seven Years' War because their alliance with Austria and Russia collapsed in 1756, and they ended up with Prussia, which was the weaker party. Um, but what they were essentially doing was winding back to the War of the Austrian Succession in the 1740s, the War of the Spanish Succession into the 1700s, and the Nine Years' War in the 1690s. Um, and that is the strategy they want, and it goes disastrously wrong. The first coalition is a terrible failure. And I think it's fair to say that in responding to that, you see the divisions of British strategy quite clearly. And British strategy is relative, I mean, we want to be careful here, is relatively easy to follow because so many people put their opinions down on paper and ministers were living in a context in which you could disagree with each other without risking imprisonment. I think that's, you know, disgrace or imprisonment. I think that's quite... Um, important. Um, so that what you've got is you've got some people who want to fight for an ideological purpose, just go on fighting in the hope that something turns up because you do not want to recognize revolutionary France. That strategy is rejected. Instead, the strategy that is adopted, and adopted, of course, on a several occasions, is the strategy of, we will negotiate with the French. We will negotiate from a position of as strong as we can be, which is why we want to gain as many colonies as possible, because we can then trade them off, as we traded off Louisbourg in 1748, as we traded off Guadeloupe and Martinique in uh, 1763. We can trade them off, and it does doesn't work. They only once leads to peace in 1802. The other attempts, the attempt in the 1790s under Pitt and the attempt of the Fox North government, they fail. So the British government ends up with a war which it really doesn't want. I think that's the key thing. Um, and it's this failure of strategy in that sense and the strains that are repeatedly revealed, uh, as they know, this is not going to be a surprise to them, but the strains that are repeatedly revealed about the, uh, op, the way of running a coalition strategy, which puts them in a really difficult position, and they only really pull it out uh, and that, in many respects, is serendipitously, it's Napoleon's failure. They only really pull it out of the bag in 1813. And even then, 
The fact that Metternich is negotiating with Napoleon as late as the as early 1814, and Metternich is prepared to have Napoleon uh, in power, holding on to Antwerp, which would be a great neighbor, that shows that Britain is in a mess. Incidentally, since you're talking to me from Shreveport, the same is true uh, of the War of 1812 with America. The War of 1812 with America is not a war Britain wanted. We can discuss whether they was behaved stupidly. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, is strategy. In strategic terms, they did not want war with America. Um, in strategic terms, the American government believes seriously that this is an opportunity to end the, Cal the Canada question once and for all. In fact, Jefferson tells Madison that he ought to be able to capture Quebec in 1812 and Halifax in 1813. And of course, that again, I mean, obviously, you've got the courage and fighting quality of the Canadians. Uh, to flatter one's American listeners. Most of these are American loyalists, of course. Um, <laughs> the first American, was well, the second American Civil War after the big one that started in 1775. But the other key thing is the American government knows it has lost as soon as it gets the news that Napoleon has failed outside Moscow. The Americans have an envoy with Napoleon. As soon as that news comes back, the Americans are trying to get either Sweden or Russia to mediate with Britain. They know they've lost. So in other words, Britain again is helped. Now, there is then all the operational stuff, the muck up of New Orleans, the greater success in the Chesapeake, the particular successes, defensive successes on the Canadian frontier, but the failure of the Lake Champlain offensive by the Brits in 1814. But all of those are subordinate to the extent to which there is a fundamental strategic world of interrelationship. And that strategic world is difficult for everybody to play. Let me ask you, um, in, in chapter two of, of the book, you talk about operationalization of strategy and you draw parallels between Napoleonic Wars and the situation in, in the two world wars. Can you um, talk about the problem of this operationalization of strategy uh, and, and the limitations of what you refer to as of shrinking the strategy to the main field army and seeking strategic solutions through uh, tactical advantages? Well, thank you. That's a really interesting question. I think I'm referring here to really two elements which are linked but separate. One, what contempor and I try and cover both of them. One, what contemporaries did, and secondly, how we perceive that situation. Let me do the second one first, and then we'll move to what contemporaries did, because they're more interesting than us. As far as, far as our perception of it, um, I think it's fair to say that the civilian dimensions or the broader dimensions of strategy have not always engaged sufficient attention of military historians, so that they have preferred to deal with, as you know, as I've called it, the operationalization of strategy, and they've prepared to often um, consider prioritization, which I think is a key element of strategy, in terms of the allocation of military units and therefore resources, rather than the bigger question of what you're trying to achieve and trying to derive um, a sensible view of potential outcomes for yourself, your opponents and third parties, which I think is the actual key element of strategy. Now, we then go back to contemporaries. It's not really surprising that faced with the latter task, which is extraordinarily difficult and which is not uh, and which circumstance, happenstance, plays a really significant role. It's not surprising that most people think, uh, who are commanders, I can shortchange this, this process by winning on the battlefield. I win on the battlefield, I deliver strategic outcome. Um, well, <laughs> I mean, that partly depends upon what the whether your strategic outcome is sensible. Um, I mean, you're an expert 
on um, continental warfare in particular. I mean, I would argue that, you know, people tend to talk about how the mid uh, 1800s the, uh, is the acme of Napoleonic strategy. That's the, the, uh, the general viewpoint, as you will know. Um, well, you could take that view about the conflict against Austria in 1805. But by the time you're on to the 1807 battles against Russia and your army is being chewed up in the really inhospitable terrain and logistical strain of, you know, the area of what is, you know, around Friedland and Erlau, I think you could argue it's been a strategic failure that going on campaigning however successful it might or might not be, is actually not delivering a strategic outcome unless your opponent chooses to negotiate. So in, in 1807, Alexander I does it, tilts it, and in 1812, the very same man doesn't. Um, if Alexander I had refused to treat in 1807, I think Napoleon was in real trouble. I, th that's a very important point to make, and uh, oftentimes that point is missing in 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 in, in kind of in the narrative that focuses on tri triumph of Napoleonic arms in 1805, 1807. Um, let me kind of uh, tra uh, trace myself maybe a little bit back and and uh, speak about or ask you about uh, broadly. Um, this is a, a world war, as you refer to in in in, in the book. So how the strategy uh, that these great powers pursued were uh, shaped by the realities of the global struggles. So how did they coordinate strategy in Europe with the strategies pursued in other parts of the world? Well, again, that's a fascinating question. Um, I think that uh, the people who I think were actually in some respects, I mean, their scan was not transoceanic, but I think the people who were most successful were the Russians. I think the Russians were really rather good at um, the relationship between the confrontation and or conflict with Sweden, uh, France, the power that's dominant in Poland, if you like, and the Ottoman Empire, as well as bringing in the Persians into their span of, of note, as you brilliantly show in your book. Um, and I think they were good at it, partly because I think they were skillful, partly because they had long experience at this, and that's a fundamental continuity. They would most recently had experience in seeing down the attempt to construct an anti-Russian coalition um, in 1790, 1791. And, you know, we referred a second ago to 1807. What is interesting is that when war breaks out with the Turks in 1806, Alexander doesn't say, uh, oh dear, I'm going to have to stop the war I'm in at the moment. He actually has a mature understanding of what um, it is possible to do. Now, to my mind, he manages that. In the case of Napoleon, I think you've got two separate questions. You've got Napoleon as revolutionary general in 1798-99, and then Napoleon as war leader. Um, as revolutionary general, I think his, con his invasion of Egypt was strategically bereft of point, it, because it uh, exposed a significant army as well as his reputation to the British Navy, knowing that the British Navy, although it had left the Mediterranean after uh, Spain joined the French side, had come back in again, and knowing that the Navy had a significant capability, the British Navy had a significant capability. It had fought battles there before, after all. Um, uh, Toulon in 1744, Malaga in 1704. Napoleon is going to have, although he's interested in the development of Taranto as a naval base, he knows that if he brings his army back, he's going to have to take it into the Western Basin of the Mediterranean. That is really dangerous. So I think that there is the there's that dimension to it. There's the dimension that he prejudges what the Turkish Ottoman, I should say, response would be, which I think is mistaken. Yes. 
Um, there is, I, I think he consistently does that actually. Um, he is certainly not an Istanbul or Constantinople hand in the sense of understanding it. And there is also his misunderstanding in my view of the possibility of France projecting its power and winning alliance through to Tipu Sultan of Mysore. Mm -hmm. I think that's much harder than he thinks. The French uh, Bourbon um, government had done that with some success in the early 1780s, but that was partly because Soufran was a great admiral uh, in the Indian Ocean, in Indian waters, and partly because they'd actually been able, using Mauritius as a base, to take an expeditionary force to India. Uh, Napoleon is not going to have that capacity, even if he grabs hold of Egypt. He doesn't have the wherewithal to move an expeditionary force down the Red Sea into the Western Basin of the Indian Ocean. So I think his idea is, is foolish. I mean, obviously, if you look at his Western plan, which you're working on now, um, the idea that could he use the capacity created by control of the French empire around the Car uh, Caribbean, Caribbean for my American listeners, and its Spanish empire as well, its Spanish allied empire. Um, I think that's a very interesting proposition, but it looked better on map than it did in practice. I think, uh, I mean, he should already have read up enough about the problems the British had encountered in the Caribbean in the 1790s, massive losses through yellow fever, the real difficulties of campaigning there, to be aware of the problems that his campaigning so, uh, faced. So in practical terms, I don't think Napoleon is running a Weltpolitik terribly effectively. Um, I let mean, me, I think- let me, let me interject here. And uh, what about the British? Do they? Because uh, you can see them in post Trafalgar period, especially projecting their influence uh, interests quite effectively in places like South America, like South Africa, like India. Do they pursue world politique? Yes, I think they do. And I think what, where I would say I think is really impressive was the concentration of force to recapture Egypt in 1801. In other words, the movement of a significant expeditionary force under Abercrombie um, uh, through the Mediterranean, training it in amphibious operations in uh, on the coast of southern Turkey, Cilicia, um, and on top of that, moving an appreciable force from India up the Indian Ocean, landing it at Suez and marching overland, and, and doing it without losing either of those forces. I mean, I think that was really, really impressive. I don't think anybody else has that capability um, to do that. Now, as you mentioned, subsequently, the British in the South Atlantic, um, they managed to move troops between Cape Town, Montevideo and Buenos Aires. And I think that, again, is impressive. Let me ask you something. Um, what, what do you see the role of Polish partitions, or Polish revolutions of 1790s in, in shaping the strategy of, of the great, that the great powers pursued and, and their long lasting legacy in that sense? Well, I think that's a really interesting question. First of all, let me say that British critics of the British government argued that there was total hypocrisy in British politics, in that the government was concerned about French expansionism and France breaking international law in the Low Countries, but allowing Russia, Austria and Prussia. <laughs> uh, and I think it's fair to say that is a reasonable accusation. Uh, I mean, in the end, the, Brit the British government had to go back to, it had the usual tension which you get in a public sphere between realist uh, interpretations and the fact that it had to moralise foreign policy in order to win 
uh, domestic support. And of course, that's an element we're all used to understanding. We can see that in the modern age. Um, as far as the, the, uh, the partition of Poland is concerned, the three partitions, uh, and indeed Napoleon brought in, as it were, a fourth partition, and then there's a fifth partition in 1814-15. As far as the partitions of Poland are concerned, I think it's fair to say that the, um, first of all, they take Russian power and concern very much more westwards than would have, on a regular basis, that would have seemed plausible earlier. They mean there's no real buffer against Russian expansion. And that's combined with, of course, the, the seizure of Finland from Sweden, of Bessarabia, what we would now call Moldova uh, from the Ottoman Empire. I think all of those elements are important. Um, so I think all of those factors are worth uh, commenting on. I think that um, Austria did not benefit at all from the destruction of the uh, of Poland. I think Austria, which was essentially a legitimist power, um, although under Joseph II it had been fascinated with ideas of redrawing European boundaries, the Bavarian exchange scheme, which continues to operate or be thought through in the 1790s, the practicality is the Austrians did not benefit from that, I think. Um, and so I think that in many respects, the partitions of Poland encourage an idea that you can change the situation radically, which is not in anybody's interest. Um, in your book, in, in the uh, introduction, you note, you note that the book focuses on European powers and deliberately excludes the United States for the sake of uh, conciseness. Can you comment on the American strategy for our listeners um, as it uh, developed during the Revolutionary Era? Yes, thank you. Um, I did a book some years ago called The War of of 1812 in the context of the Napoleonic Wars. And I tried to look at this question. I mean, essentially, very crudely, as you know, there are two essential strategies on offer. The Federalist strategy, which is one of maritime interests, essentially seeking good relations with Britain, essentially a, um, a if you like, a um, cautious approach to international relations and what one might call the Jeffersonian or Democratic Republican tradition which is sees the British in Canada as the root cause of Native American opposition that's a, 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 an unrealistic view um, and is also interestingly enough um, both bellicose but also doesn't want to have a large military and I think that that underlines the relationship between domestic uh, notions of politics um, and, uh, and, and constitutionalism, because Jefferson argues that a large military will be the basis of a powerful state, and the reality um, that um, America's ability to operate depends on the marginal relationship of its power to any close uh, balance between Britain and France. If there is no close balance, uh, and there appears to be briefly a close balance in 1812, Napoleon is the most powerful ruler uh, in the, you know, in Europe, then it appears to uh, Britain the most powerful ruler in the Atlantic, there appears to be a balance which the Americans can factor into their own benefit. Um, but if you haven't got that, America didn't really have the power to give substance to its, to its grand strategy. And I'll take that a stage further. If you look at American power in the 19th century as a whole, which, as you know, I discussed in my book, The Making of you know, Struggle for Mastery in North America, the Americans essentially benefit by fighting relatively weak powers. Mexico, 1846 to 1848, Spain, 1898, the Native Americans. Um, and it, they're able to do that without having to create a permanent, strong, militarized, military industrial complex, which is what they are going to have to have in order to win World War II and win the Cold War. So America has a strategy which depends on picking the right enemies. 
<laughs> it, uh, and, and indeed that's so often the case when it picks the wrong enemy as it does in 1812 it's in a mess it's lucky that the british don't want revanche <laughs> napoleon, napoleon is very unlucky because the russians having beaten him up in 1812 napoleon isn't intelligent enough to then give him the terms that they want the Americans are intelligent enough in 1815 to act, well, already the Treaty of Ghent had been negotiated really at the end of 1814, to just say, let's keep calm. We're going to say to the Brits, we essentially want a status quo antebellum. Let's just leave it like that. That was very clever of the Americans. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to ask more of a uh, uh, finalizing que uh, question because you yeah. already have been so generous with your time what are the big lessons that these powers learn strategic lessons from the napoleonic wars because i think one of the themes that we see in your book is drawing parallels to later periods and you connect it to both the crimean war period but especially so you you try to connect the strategic lessons learned to the world war both uh, two world wars. Um, so what are the big lessons that you can identif identify that were learned, or maybe not, in, in this period? Well, I think they're learnt by the end. By the As it were, there's two learning curves. They finish in 1814 and 1815 with the two abdications of Napoleon. And the Allies learn that they can only finally have a settlement if they also substantially change the domestic uh context of the power they're fighting and in a way that underlines what happens in 1918 and 1945 and i think that that was a sensible learning everything else was going to be a short term uh settlement as you know for example the russo um uh, german settlement of 1939 to 1941 that was essentially ephemeral because it left in power two hostile potentates to each other so i think it's the understanding that strategy requires a domestic component as well and i think that the obvious example of that is the Napoleonic Wars end with an allied occupation of much of France and that is I think a key lesson and a lesson very different to where you would have seen previous wars ending. That's right and uh, th there is a wonderful study by Christine Haynes uh, that, that there is it's a very good that, one yeah that un and un it underscores that yes yeah and it actually also shows international cooperation in you know, I mean, it's a, it's it's more successful than the operation in after 1945. Different context, of course, <laughs> right. but more successful. So, as a, as a quick follow up, what about the lessons of coalition warfare and how they did they stay relevant? Well, I think you're absolutely right because pra the Holy Alliance represents this, and you could argue that the Holy Alliance and its ability to integrate Louis the Eighteenth into the system, and then Charles the Tenth, so that you get the French invasion of Spain in 1823 to restore order. What it shows is an understanding that that is the way forward. I think that that no, I agree with you entirely on that. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jeremy, for this uh, insight, for for being so generous with your time. Uh, I remind listeners uh, about the new book that Professor Black published on the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars: Strategies for World Wars. Well, thank you, thank you very much. May I congratulate you in turn on your books, say how excited I am by the new one coming out, um, and also say to all American friends and listeners, I am very sorry not to have had the opportunity to visit your great country in the last two years. We Best wishes. <laughs> I think if this is an oversight, we'll be able to fix soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't blame you for COVID. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Please then, bye.